welcome to Meeple University's How to Play Brass Lancashire. In Brass Lancashire, two to four players play the role of industrialists in industrial revolutionary England. Players will be competing to build industry tiles and canal or rail linkages on the map. Players will then be trying to activate the victory points on their industries in various ways which are unique to each industry type. The game is played over two eras, the Canal Era and the Rail Era, each of which lasts 8 to 10 rounds depending on the player count. At the end of each of the two eras, players will score all of their flipped industries and all of their Canal or Rail linkages depending on the number of flipped industries they connect. After the two eras, the player with the highest score wins. Brass Lancashire is a 2018 re-release of the 2007 game Brass. It has new art, and other than a couple of streamlined mechanics, it is the same as the classic game. At the same time as releasing Brass Lancashire, Roxley Games released Brass Birmingham, a new game which is based on fundamentally the same mechanics, but with a few different industry tiles to give a different flavour to the game. In this video, we'll be going just through Brass Lancashire, but we'll release a separate video that will help you play Brass Birmingham once you know Brass Lancashire. To set up the game, place the board with this side face up. Don't use the side showing this icon, as this is used for a variant of the game. If you're playing with fewer than four players, you'll need to remove some cards and distant cotton tiles from your decks based on the player count icons in the bottom corner of the cards. You'll also remove these two cards in all player counts, as these are used in the variant. Shuffle the remaining tiles and place them here, and shuffle the remaining cards, deal a number of them face down, equal to the number of players in the game, cover them with this tile, and place the rest on top. The cards that you've covered up won't be used in the canal era of the game. Place the white cylinder on this space. Fill the coal and iron markets with cubes from the main supply, and leave the rest of the cubes off to the side. Each player takes a player board and all of the components in his or her colour. This should be 14 link tiles with a canal on one side and a railway on the other. 37 industry tiles, all of which have a matching icon on the player board indicating where to place them. And a turn order marker and two scoring markers. Place the turn order markers in a random order for the first round. Place each player's hexagonal victory point scoring marker on the zero space and place each player's circular income marker on the 10 space which corresponds to the zero income. Then each player takes 30 pounds from the bank. We're using the iron clays poker chip style coins which come with the deluxe edition of the game. And each player draws a hand of eight starting cards. You're now ready to play. During the course of the game, each player takes it in turn order in each round to take two actions, discarding a card from his or her hand for each action. Most of the actions will involve placing industry tiles on the map or placing link tiles between locations on the map. Before I go through the details on what each of the five different types of actions are, there are a number of rules relating to the map and specifically how connectivity between locations and resources work on the map, which are overarching to the whole game. And so I'm going to talk about those first before coming back and talking about the specifics of the actions. This is how the board might look during the canal era. You'll see that there are industry tiles in various locations and canal link tiles connecting some of them up. Firstly, I'll talk about a player's network. 
A player's network is any location containing one or more of the player's industry tiles or adjacent to one or more of the player's link tiles. So in the case of the yellow player, the yellow's network comprises Liverpool, Wigan, Warrington and Runcorn, Manchester and Bury. The player's network is not necessarily connected to each other. So in the white player's case, Preston is not connected to the rest of his or her network, but because it contains that industry tile, it is still considered part of it. The second general map concept is connectivity. Two locations are connected if a path can be traced between them using constructed link tiles, regardless of which player owns them. So in this case, Rochdale is connected to Liverpool, even though the path traced between them goes through three different players' canals. Meanwhile, Preston is not connected to any canals or rails, so it is not connected to any other location on the map. Next, I'll talk about how to consume coal and iron. Certain actions in the game require you to spend coal and or iron in order to build industry or links or do other actions. And the rules for how you consume coal and iron differ. So I'll go through these now. Coal and iron can be found in two locations. On players industry tiles on the main map and in the coal and iron markets on the top of the board. When a player takes an action which requires consuming iron, the player must first consume iron from locations on the map before consuming from the market. The player can take an iron cube from any location on the map, regardless of which player owns it, and regardless of whether or not it is connected to the location which requires the iron. If a player needs to consume iron and there is none on an industry tile on the map, the player must then purchase the iron from the iron market paying the cost shown on the left hand side of this table for each cube. If there are no cubes in the market, the player can still buy iron to consume for a cost of five pounds each. The consumption of coal is more restrictive than the consumption of iron. When a player takes an action which requires coal, such as building this, the player must source that coal from the closest connected location on the board. Again, it doesn't matter which player owns this, you simply must count the number of connected links to that location, and whichever one has the fewest links is the location the coal is consumed from. In the event of a tie, the player who is performing the action chooses which of the tied locations the coal is sourced from. The coal source must be connected, and so if this canal were not here, the coal for this cotton mill would have been sourced from Rochdale, even though Bolton is geographically closer. If there is no coal on the map, or if any coal on the map is disconnected from the location using that coal, the player can then look to buy coal from the coal market. However, in order to do this, the location using the coal must be connected to a tile or location showing the double arrowed icon. This will be any of the ports, these anchors, these all have double arrow icons, or some of the printed locations on the board. As long as the location has connectivity to a double arrow, the player can then buy the coal from the market, again at the price shown on the side here. Once again, if the coal market is empty of cubes, coal can still be purchased at five pounds a piece. If the source using the coal is not connected to a source of coal or to a market space, such as if these two canals were not here, then there is no way to get coal to this location and the action cannot be taken. These different rules can be remembered with these icons. Consumption of coal requires connectivity, consumption of iron does not. And while the iron does not require the double arrow, the coal does. The game offers a thematic reason why coal and iron are consumed differently. 
Iron was used in relatively small quantities and could be moved around by horse and cart, but coal was required in industrial quantities and needed a good transportation network set up in order to consume it. The game of Brass Lancashire takes place over two eras, the Canal Era and the Rail Era. Each era takes place over eight, nine or ten rounds, depending on your player count. During each round, in turn order, each player will take two actions. The exception to this is the first round of the Canal Era, in which each player will take only one action. There are five different actions a player can choose from in the game. Build, Network, Develop, Sell and Loan. To take any of these actions, the player must discard one card from his or her hand and then perform the action. A player will therefore discard two cards and perform two actions in each round. During the first half of each era, a player will end his or her turn by redrawing back up to eight cards. In the last four rounds of each era, the draw deck will have been depleted and so a player will discard two cards during that turn and then have fewer cards for the rest of the era. Once all players have run out of cards, that signifies the end of an era. During each round, any money that a player spends is placed on his or her turn order marker, not paid directly to the bank. All players will do this, and then at the end of the round, the next round's turn order is set in ascending order of money spent in the previous round. Like so. In the case of a tie, the previous round's turn order remains. After rearranging the turn order, players receive income based on their current location on the income track. That is, the number in the coin icon next to where his or her income marker is. So blue in this case would receive four coins from the bank into his or her supply. Some players, if they've taken loans, may need to pay money back to the bank during this phase. Such money is paid directly to the bank, not onto the turn order spaces. Income is not paid in the final round of the rail era. The first type of action is the build action which allows you to put industry tiles on the board. You can only build industry tiles from the lowest available spot on any given column on your player board. And you can only build specific types of industry tiles on given spaces on the board. For example, these three Liverpool spaces can only take a port. This space in Warrington and Runcorn could take either a cotton mill or a coal mine. Note that in a location where one tile space is dedicated to a type of industry and another is split between two, you must fill up the dedicated space first before filling a split one with the matching type of industry. How you build your industry depends upon the card you discard. If you discard a card with the matching industry type, then you can only build that type of industry and it must be in a location currently within your network. So here the player could build a port in Liverpool or Ellesmere port, but would not be able to build one in one of these other locations as it's not part of the network. Alternatively, the player may discard a location card to build any of the matching type of industries in that location, regardless of whether or not that location is in the player's network. So the player could build any one of those three in Warrington and Runcorn using this card, despite not being connected to that location. The player's third option is to discard any two cards, regardless of whether they're industries or locations, to treat them as a different location card. For example, the player could discard those two, treat it as a Preston card, and then build one of the matching industries in Preston. When a player does this, he or she is using both of the cards that he or she would use on this turn. 
In other words, the player is sacrificing one of his or her two actions for the round in order to build in the desired location. At the start of the game, before the player has anything on the map, the player may use an industry card to build that type of industry in any matching location. But once the player has any sort of network on the board, the player is restricted by normal connectivity and network restrictions. Note that in the three player game, you'll be removing all of the location cards associated with the teal locations. And in the two player game, you'll also remove all of the cards for blue locations. This does not remove these locations from the game. You can still build in these locations in lower player counts. However, you will not have the cards to help you build in those locations. So it will be a little more difficult for you to build your networks up there. The cost to build each industry tile is shown on the left hand side of that tile on your player board. All tiles will require some payment in money and some will also require the consumption of coal and or iron. Remember the restrictions from before. When consuming iron, it can be consumed from anywhere on the board, but when consuming coal, that tile must be connected to a source of coal. On the right hand side of each tile is depicted the number of victory points that will be unlocked and the amount of income that will be received when a player flips that tile over. I'll also draw your attention to these icons. Any tile showing this symbol can be built only during the canal era, not during the rail era. And anything that showing this icon can be built only during the rail era. Note also that these shipyard tiles with the lock on it cannot be built using this action. They need to be removed using the develop action, which I'll talk about later. Note that during the canal era, no player may have more than one industry tile built in the same location. But once we've moved into the rail era, players may have as many industry tiles in one location as they wish. Next, I'll talk about the five different types of industries and how they activate. Firstly, an ironworks. When a player builds an ironworks in any location, he or she immediately takes the number of iron cubes matching the icon in the corner and places them on that ironworks. These are now available for players to consume as they do their actions. Additionally, if the iron market is not full, the player immediately fills it from his or her ironworks, claiming the amount of money shown in the table for each iron sold. Any iron that hasn't been consumed in the market remains on that tile. Building a coal mine works in much the same way. When a player places a coal mine, he or she takes the corresponding number of coal cubes and places them onto that industry tile, ready to be consumed. Once again, if the coal market is not full and this coal mine is connected via links to the double arrow market icon, the player then fills up the coal market and receives that amount of money for each coal that was sold. This occurs only at the time that the coal mine is placed. If the coal market is later emptied or if the coal market is not linked to that coal mine at the time it is placed, the player will not fill up the coal market in this way. Coal mines and ironworks are flipped over unlocking their income and victory points when the last cube is removed from them by consumption on the general map. Once this happens, the player flips over the tile, immediately receives the income by moving his or her income marker that many spaces up the track. This refers to spaces on the track, not levels of income. So while the income raised by seven, the player's actual income in money raised by only four. And it reveals a number of victory points which are scored at the end of the era. They are not scored immediately. Ironworks will flip over in the same way when all of the cubes are consumed. When cotton mills and ports are placed on the board, 
nothing else immediately happens. These can later be flipped over by using the cell action, which I'll go into later. Note that each port comes with a double arrow market sign, which can be used for purchasing coal from the coal market. And this is present on both the face down and the flipped side. The final type of industry is the shipyard. And the shipyard is flipped over immediately when it is placed. Shipyards are worth more victory points than the other industries, but they have no other effect on the game and they're more difficult to get. As for the other industries, these points are scored only at the end of each era. Normally, industry tiles which have been placed on the board will remain there for the rest of the game, but it is possible to build over the top of industry tiles. At any time, by doing a normal build action, you can build over the top of one of your own industries. When you do this, you discard the old industry and build the new one in its place. But be warned that when you do this, you are taking that tile off the board. You will still retain the income that you've already gained, but you will not gain those victory points because the victory points are scored at the end of the era. So in doing this, you would only do it to upgrade victory points when you've got nowhere else to place a high level industry. There is also a very specific way that you can build over the top of someone else's coal mine or ironworks, but only for those two types of industry. In order to do this, there must be no cubes of the corresponding industry type on the board at all. That means none on tiles on the map and none in the corresponding market. If it meets that requirement, you can use a normal build action to discard somebody else's tile and build your own in its place. And this will take the cubes, which may fill up the market as usual. The player whose tile you overbuilt, once again, they will keep the income that they've already gained, but they will lose access to these victory points. And so this can be an area of particular strategy through the end of the game. Players who have invested points in those markets do not necessarily want to see the main market dry up or their victory points be, may be taken from them. The second action available is to network, which is to build your canals or rail links onto the board, depending on which era you're in. To perform the network action, first discard any card from your hand, it does not matter what card. Then place one or two links, depending on what era we're in, and I'll go into that in a second, onto the board. You can only place canals during the canal era, and you can only place railways during the rail era. Canals can only go on links that show the blue canal marker and rail can go on links that show the railway line. But there are several railways on the board which cannot handle canals in the first era. When placing a link, the link must be adjacent to a location that is in your network. So at this point here, the white player could place a canal here, which is connected through Oldham, here connected through Bury, or any of these locations connected through Manchester but he or she could not place canals over here in locations not in his or her network. Then pay the cost for the link or links, which is shown up here in this spot on the board. During the canal era, you can use the network action only to build a single canal, which will cost you three pounds. During the rail era, you have the choice with a single network action, either to build one rail link for five pounds or to build two rail links for 15 pounds. Additionally, for each railway that you build, you must be able to consume one coal cube. As usual, when consuming coal, it must be taken from the closest connected location to the place where you're consuming that coal. In the case of links, the coal is consumed after placing the link. So in this case, the coal would come from Wigan, even though it was not connected until the link was placed.
The third action is to develop. To take the develop action, the player must first discard one card from his or her hand. Again, it doesn't matter which card is discarded to do this action. Then, the player chooses one or two industry tiles, with those tiles coming from the bottom of their respective columns, and discards them. These are now removed from the game. The player must then consume one iron for each tile which is developed. And these come either from players' ironworks on the board, or if there is no iron, it comes from the iron market, as usual. Players gain no direct benefit for the tiles they discard through development, but players may still wish to develop industries rather than build them in order to get quicker access to the higher points paying industry tiles. Additionally, any industry tiles with the blue half moon icon cannot be built during the rail era. So if a player has any of these left over in the rail era, Using the develop action is the only way to get rid of them to get access to higher levels. Additionally, these two shipyard tiles, represented by the padlock, can never be built on the main board, and so using the develop action is the only way to get rid of them. The fourth action is to sell, and selling is the means by which you flip over your cotton mills and ports. To perform the sell action, you first discard any card from your hand. And again, it does not matter which card this is. Then you must have at least one unflipped cotton mill on the board. This is the location from which you will be selling your cotton. Next, you choose where you will be selling the cotton to. You have two options. You can sell either to an unflipped port tile this can belong to yourself or to any other player, but it must be connected to the cotton mill via links. Or alternatively, you can sell to the distant cotton market. In order to do this, the cotton mill must be connected to a tile or location with the double arrow icon. To sell to a port tile, flip over the cotton mill and flip over the port tile. The owners of those tiles immediately score the income bonus printed on those tiles and have unlocked those victory points for the end of the era. To sell to the distant cotton market, flip over the top tile from the distant cotton pile. Move this marker down the number of spaces shown on that tile in this zigzag pattern. Then, as long as the token has not reached the X space, flip your cotton tile over and gain your income plus the income that is printed next to the location of that tile. So in this case 5 plus 2 is 7 additional income. If when you draw this tile the marker moves down into the X space, the distant cotton market is saturated with cotton and you lose your sell action. You do not get to flip your cotton mill in this situation. And you'll need to come back on a subsequent turn and sell to a port tile. The tiles in the distant cotton market range from 0 to negative 4. This marker will get reset to the top at the end of the canal era to start afresh in the rail era. A single sell action allows you to sell from as many of your cotton mills on the board as you want. And so it can be more efficient to save up all your cotton mills and sell them all at once, but it's more risky as the number of ports may diminish. You can sell multiple times into the distant cotton market on the same turn, drawing a new tile for each one. But as soon as you attempt to sell into the market and drop the marker to an X, your turn ends and you're not allowed to attempt to sell any more cotton on that turn. The fifth and final type of action in the game is to take a loan. In order to take a loan, the player must first discard a card, and again, it does not matter what type of card this is. Then, the player takes 10, or 20, or 30 pounds, and to represent the interest, drops his or her income by one 
two or three levels. The player always places his or her income marker on the top space corresponding to the new income level. You cannot take a loan if it would drop your income to below negative 10. The loan never has to be paid back during the game. It is the loss of income which represents you paying that loan back. Taking loans in Brass Lancashire is not uncommon and it is not a bad strategy to do so if you've got the income to play with. So, in summary, on each player's turn, he or she will take two actions out of the five actions available in the game, and the player can take the same action twice. The available actions are to build industry tiles on the main board, to build link tiles into a network on the board, to develop industry by discarding industry tiles from the player's player board, to sell cotton from the main board into a port, and to take a loan for more money. Of those five actions, you'll notice that the only action for which the card that is discarded is important is the build action. When taking the build action, you're limited to building either the industry you discard or in the location that you discard. For all other actions, you can discard any card and take the action in full. If you have no legal move, you can pass, but you must still discard a card in order to pass. Once only four rounds remain in the canal era, this tile will become visible. Players will no longer redraw any cards to their hand and will play the final four rounds only with the eight cards they have. The cards underneath this tile, for which there'll be one per player, are not used in the canal era. Once all players have run out of cards, the era is over. Complete the normal end of round activities, that is, switching the turn order and gaining income, and then proceed to end of canal era scoring. First, score all canals. A canal scores one point for every revealed link symbol, that is this hexagon with a line through it, which is adjacent to the link. These can be found on the back, the flipped side of industry tiles, and some printed on the main board. Unflipped industry tiles do not show the link icon. So each canal scores one point for every linked icon, so this one would score three, this one would score two, this would score one, and so on. Canals can be removed from the board as you score them. Then, each flipped industry tile scores for its owner the number of victory points printed in the bottom left corner. In this case two, in this case five, and so on. Unflipped industry tiles score nothing. Then mark the player's scores out using the hexagonal scoring markers. Next, to set up for the rail era, remove all level 1 industry tiles, whether they've been flipped or unflipped, and whether they have cubes on them or not, from the main board. Once you've done this, the map will be almost reset, and you'll be left with just a few level 2 industries which were built during the canal era. Do not remove any level 1 industries that are still on your player board. To get rid of these, you will have to use the develop action during the rail era. Then, gather up all of the used distant cotton tiles, shuffle them together with the unused ones, and make a new stack for the rail era. Move the distant cotton marker back to the top and shuffle all of the cards, including the ones that were under the tile at the end of the canal era, shuffle them all together, deal two cards per player into this space, cover them with the tile, with this side up, deal eight cards per player once again, and Place the rest here as a new draw deck. 
Once you've proceeded into the rail era, a couple of rules change. You can no longer build level 1 industries, which will have this icon next to them, and you can no longer build canals. You'll now be building rail, which you can build one or two at a time, and which will require coal. You can also now build multiple industry tiles in the same location. Once this tile has been revealed, it signifies that there are five rounds left in the game. And the purpose of this tile is to remind you that the upcoming round is the last round in which you are allowed to take the loan action. Once the draw deck is expired in the final four rounds of the game, players may no longer take the loan action. Once all players have played their final cards in the rail era, the game is over. Players do not gain income after the final round. Then proceed to end game scoring. And scoring occurs exactly the same way as it did in the mid game. All links score one point for each link symbol that is adjacent to it. And all industries that are flipped score for their owner the victory points shown in the bottom left hand corner. Additionally, players receive one victory point for every 10 coins they have left over at the end of the game. The player with the highest score wins, and in the event of a tie, the player who is furthest up the income track wins, and if still tied, the player with the most leftover money. Money is not cashed in when gaining victory points at a 1 to 10 rate at the end of the game. If still tied, the victory is shared. And that's how to play Brass Lancashire. I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope you enjoy playing. And if you'd now like to learn how to play Brass Birmingham, given you know Brass Lancashire, you can click on the banner or the link in the description to take you to our shorter video on the differences between the games. Thanks for watching and click on the Meeple to subscribe to our channel if you'd like to hear more from Meeple University.